Well, I don't know about you all, but if it was up to me, I'd just sit down and we'd listen to the soldier show a little while longer. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty special, pretty awesome. Uh, in the Air Force, we have tops in blue, uh, airmen performing for airmen. Uh, and they go all over the world, and they entertain each other, uh, which is taking care of airmen, taking care of soldiers. That's really what it's all about. So I tell you what, it is great to be home, though. Uh, it is great to be in Huntsville. It's great to have my mom and dad here, my brother here. Uh, it means a lot uh, that you've been there for all the special moments, and it's neat that I can come back to Huntsville and just talk to you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about change today, and I'm going to use Huntsville as a backdrop for change. I'm going to tell my story a little bit because not all of you know my whole story, so I'm going to tell that a little bit and, and talk about change and, and how difficult change is sometimes, but how amazing change can be. Uh, but the first thing I'll tell you is when we landed uh, yesterday, uh, came in on a C-21, landed at, at Huntsville Airport. Uh, we got here a little bit early. It was uh, about 11.30 uh, when we landed, and uh, I didn't have a meeting at Redstone Arsenal until about 1.30. So the first thing we did when we came out of the airport is we turned left and went to Greenbrier. <laughs> and... Uh, and I tell you what, my aide and, and my uh, security uh, detail, they had never been to Greenbrier. <laughs> and, uh, and I ordered the small pork platter, and my aide ordered the small catfish platter, and my security detail ordered the rib platter. <laughs> and I looked at him when he ordered it, because I knew what was coming, and he didn't know what was coming. And they brought out the most monstrous, awesome platter of rib you've ever seen. And I said, welcome to Alabama. Uh, but uh, I tell you, when you think about change, and you have to go back and, and really look at what Huntsville was like when we moved here. Uh, my dad came to Huntsville with mom and, and our, the three kids, uh, John, Scott, and Catherine. Uh, we came here in the late part of 1965. Uh, we moved into an apartment over on Patton Road, right outside the arsenal, just for a short period of time. Then we moved into a house on Logan Drive in the southwest part of town. And uh, when we moved into that house, you know, a lot of people know my story, Chaffee Elementary School and how big the Saturn program was. But when you're a six-year-old or a four-year-old or a two-year-old, when you come to a place and you go into it, you're not thinking about the space business. You're, what you do when you move into the house on Logan Drive is you look out back and you see a cotton field that goes forever. Uh, and you realize, what an awesome place to go play. What an awesome place to go field force. And you go to the end of the road, and you go down the end of the road, and down at the end of the road is a swamp, literally a swamp, with dark trees and ponds and, and frogs and snakes and everything that little kids just love. And then you grow up in a neighborhood where you can go out and play in the cotton field, and you can go with Richard Hatmaker and Scott, and, and you can go out into the cotton field and set up forts and and the farmer really didn't care, and, and then you go down to the swamp and you play all day, and then you come in at lunchtime and you just pick a house. It didn't matter whose house it was, it just, you walk into the house and you have lunch. Could have been the hat makers, could have been the Cawthons, could have been anybody. You walk in, you have lunch. And that was Huntsville in 1965 and 1966. It was a small town, and it was an agricultural town, because when we went to Whitesburg Elementary School, every fall we would take a day off of school. The whole school would go off, and what would you go do? You go pick cotton. Uh, you go pick cotton for a day. And after you're done picking cotton, you go down to the Lily Flag Gin on, you know, Lily Flag Road. Uh, hopefully many of you remember the Lily Flag Gin that was down there. And you go down and you watch them gin the cotton. And that's what life as a kid in Huntsville was like in 1965 and 1966. And then in 1967, now I'm eight years old, all of a sudden my dad's working on Apollo and the Apollo 1 accident happens and Chaffee, White, and Grissom all pass away. One of the most tragic elements of the space business. And I always say one of the greatest miracles in mankind is going from that accident to walking on the moon in two years. How is that even possible? Can you even imagine that today? But going from that accident on Apollo 1 to an entire new rocket flying to the moon and putting a man on the moon walking in two years. But the other story that's amazing, that some of you have heard before, but that story is that cotton field in my backyard became Chaffee Elementary School in the same period of time. And Grissom High School opened in 1969 in the same period of time. Uh, White 
middle school on the other side of town open the same period of time. But I got to go to Chaffee Elementary School, and I had teachers like Ms. Bradshaw, who still tells Scott stories, uh, which is frightening stories. If you ever get a chance to hear Scott stories, it's worth the price of admission, I guarantee you. But Ms. Bradshaw was a great teacher, and she got me even more excited in math. And I was a good student going on, but when you get a great teacher like Mrs. Bradshaw, who says that you can really do things, you get really excited. And then as you get to Grissom, one of my favorite teachers of all time was Rebecca Hill, organic chemistry. Holy cow, she scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I can't tell you how much she scared the heck out of me. I, I had, uh, all the way through school, I got, I got A's. I just, my dad told me to get A's, my mom told me to get A's, so I got A's. And uh, I didn't want to come home without A's, and I went to my first test with Mrs. Hill, and I didn't format the paper correctly, and so far I got a zero. Not a B, not a C, not a D, not an F, but a zero. And I came home just in tears, uh, and my father and mother go, well, you screwed up. Go fix it. So I get down with Mrs. Hill. She, that was the hardest I think I've ever worked in my life to get through that. But she taught me to do things right and taught me the value of hard work. And then my senior year in high school, I had Mrs. Spillman as my math teacher. So Mrs. Spillman was the calculus teacher. Actually, I actually looked back at the yearbook the other day, and it actually didn't say calculus, because that was the first calculus course that was taught in Huntsville. Mrs. Spillman decided there was a bunch of students that really could do calculus and needed to do calculus, and so she decided that she would start a calculus class for about 20 of us who wanted to study calculus. And so my senior year, I got to study calculus. Now, those of you who had kids and those of you, the young folks that have taken calculus in, heck, ninth grade probably today, it's really not that big a deal. But in Huntsville, Alabama, back in 1976, to teach calculus in high school was an amazing thing. And, and it helped me get into Harvard. Because when you went to take the SAT and you went to take the math portion of the advanced placement tests and, and the various tests that you had to take to get in, all of a sudden I was at the level I needed to be to compete for those things. And this Mrs. Johnson, the senior counselor, uh, looked at me and said, John, you ought to, you ought to apply to some different places. Uh, when I got into Harvard, uh, I also got into other places. I had choices to make, and I decided for a number of reasons, family reasons probably, but decided to go to Harvard. Uh, and then I went to Harvard, and my grandmother, who lived out in Grant, uh, on Lake Gunnersville, actually, but she went to the Grant Post Office. Uh, she was so proud that I got into Harvard that she, uh, she made me a care package with bread and butter pickles and, and jams and all the things that I wouldn't know what to do at Harvard. But she picked all that stuff and cookies and everything in a giant box and put John Hyten, Wigglesworth A12, Harvard University, <laughs> giant letters on the box. And she, uh, she takes it to the Grant Post Office. And she walks in the Grant Post Office and she slides that box across and the postmaster, because it's the postmaster, there's only one in Grant, Alabama at the time, she looks, Miss Hyten, how are you? It's good to see you today. How's everything? Everything going good? Everything's going fine? So uh, what you doing today? I'm sending a care package to my son. He's off at of college. Well, that's awesome. And she looks down and she sees Harvard University because it's an eight-block letter. So where is, where is Harvard University? And she goes, that's up north in Boston. She goes, really? Couldn't he get into Alabama or Auburn? <laughs> so then I got in the Air Force. And I tell you what, my plan, and I told everybody, my family, everybody knew what my plan was. My plan was four years in the Air Force, and I was going to get out and make my fortune. That was, that was the plan. Uh, the Air Force was kind enough to pay for my entire Harvard education. Uh, Huntsville set me up to do that. I told the Air Force I wanted to travel, see the world. I got assigned to Gunner Air Force Station, Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> but that's okay, because I'm only going to be in four years. It's really not that big a deal. Because when I came in in 1981, you got to realize there was no such thing as a space command in the military. Air Force Space Command was formed in 1982. Didn't exist. 
I wanted to get in the space business, there's no doubt about that, but that really did not exist as a career in the Air Force. It existed in a small element out in Los Angeles where they built all the stuff, but it was all classified, all secret, nobody really knew about it. And so it brings me back to the concept of change. Because what happened in Huntsville over those years? Because when we came in 1965, Huntsville was an agricultural community. It was focused on cotton. Now, Von Braun was here, the rocket business was here, things were coming, but they were kind of invisible to the city. It was a small town, the German scientists kind of came in and moved into the, a lot of the south part of town. They started putting things in here, but it was still focused on agriculture. Well, by the time I went off to college, this place was the head of the space world, the builder of the Saturn V, the Apollo program, the space shuttle program, everything came out of the Marshall Space Flight Center, and then the Army came in in a big way. And the Army came in, what used to be Redstone Arsenal and Missile Command, that was kind of the only thing was here. Then the Army came in with aviation and material and all the things that came in here, and all of a sudden Huntsville just became huge. And then SDI came, and, and missile defense, and all the elements of that came as well. And you look at the way Huntsville grew and changed, and it's truly remarkable. What was a small agricultural community that was focused on cotton and focused on those pieces, and it was a great place to grow up and live and a great place for a kid to grow up, all of a sudden changed. And did the city of Huntsville sit back and say, I don't really like this change thing. I would like it to stay the way it was. There's a bunch of people in this room that were probably of that camp that said, you know, I really don't want Huntsville to change. I want Huntsville to stay this small town that's focused on agriculture, where you can walk into Unisys and, and have a piece of country ham and everybody knows who you are. And you can walk into the little places like the Green Bar and have lunch and everybody knows who you are. And you can, you can imagine walking in a four-star uniform. It's a little different. But the, the amazing thing is Huntsville embraced change. They embraced the space program. They embraced the Army. They embraced all the pieces coming in. And Huntsville, because of that, has become just an amazing, amazing place to live, serve, uh, work, play. It's just an amazing city. And Huntsville continues to embrace change as it goes through, and it's just remarkable. And then you compare that to what I've been through in my career in the space business. Because like I said, in 1981, there was no space command. Space Command formed in 1982. And then we started down a path of changing warfare. But we didn't see it that way at the time. There were, there were folks that came long before me that looked and understood what space would do, understood that GPS could fundamentally change warfare forever, that satellite communications could change maneuver warfare forever. No more would we ever have a soldier that was stuck someplace in the world, couldn't communicate, didn't want, was, know what was over the next hill, didn't have the ability to understand where he was on the planet. All of that stuff was changed because of space. And it was amazing to be part. There's not very many people in the world that could be part of a fundamental change in anything in the world, but much less a fundamental change in warfare. And that's what I got to be a part of because I moved into the space business through a miracle things. And then we were stationed here in Huntsville uh, working for the Army. Uh, you heard I was the special advisor of the United States Army. Uh, we thought we were going to be here a couple weeks, ended up being here almost a year, actually over a year when you do the math. Uh, but my wife came in and, jo and joined me, uh, first time that she'd stopped working because we had two babies at the time. We said, being apart is just not going to work. She packed the U-Haul, came across the country. Uh, she got pregnant, had our child, uh, second child, while we were here in Huntsville, uh, the only native Alabamian, by the way. He lived here all of two months, but he continues to point out that he's the noted only native Alabamian. Uh, and when you look at uh, our family, my wife looked at Huntsville and liked Huntsville, and I looked around and I interviewed for jobs because I was going to get out. That was the plan. And I interviewed for jobs and I got the great job, the job that I wanted, the job that would pay me crazy money, the job that would get me the big house and the golf course, the job that would uh, allow us to live the way we wanted to. And I came home and told Laura I was getting out of the Air Force. And she said, why are you quitting? 
So I'm not quitting. I'm, I'm just getting out of the Air Force because I have a better opportunity. So why is it a better opportunity? Well, I would get more money. Don't we have enough money now? Um, well, yeah, we, we do, but we could have a bigger house. You don't like where we live? Um, so why are you going to quit the Air Force? And she kept hammering. Why are you quitting? And then she said, I thought you loved the Air Force. And I said, I do love the Air Force. She said, I thought you loved serving your country. And I said, I love serving my country. And then she said, why would you quit? And I realized for the first time in my life, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to serve the Air Force for as long as the Air Force would have me. And so I did not think it was going to be 34 years and counting. That was not the plan. But if Laura hadn't been asked me that question, and it was funny because she asked it here in Huntsville, Alabama, none of that would have happened. Uh, and that leads me into change again. Because holy cow, you want stability, you want all those th kind of things. If you're going in the Air Force, and this is 1990 now, think of 1990, the walls just come down, pieces breaking out all over the world. I had a friend of mine that says, what are you going to stay in the Air Force for? You'll have nothing to do. And you look at the last 25 years, oh my gosh. It's just crazy. The change in the world, in many ways horrible, in many ways amazing. But being involved in the space business all that time and the change has been remarkable. And then you look at the fundamental change in warfare that I talked about, that every military operation that takes place on the planet today is fundamentally tied to space in some way or the other. And then you realize that change has to happen again and change has to happen now in my own command. Because all that change we made was not invisible to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world has seen that change. And they understand the power that space brings to our military on the battlefield. And they're working with ways, uh, working on ways to challenge that. And now we have a contested, threatened domain that we have to worry about for the first time. And that's not the way we trained our airmen, our soldiers, our sailors to operate with space. We train them to assume a benign environment. In fact, our airmen on the ops floor today, everything that is GPS for the world comes out of a little squadron, seven people operating today, average age 23. Everything that is GPS for the world comes out of those seven people's hands today. Everything. That's a remarkable thing. But if, if they see a threat today, their checklist tells them to call an engineer because they're not trained to respond to a threat. Well, they have to be changed, trained to respond to a threat because we have threats that we face now. And every military member in this room understands what to do in the face of a threat. And we're going to understand how to do that in space as well. So it's a fundamental change. And change is difficult. Change is difficult as we go forward, but this command, my command, our enterprise, when we look at national security space, fundamentally has to change as we go into the future, because if it doesn't change, we will not be able to handle the challenges that we face from potential adversaries as we go into the future. So we're going to change. We're absolutely going to change, and change is not a bad thing. You look at Huntsville today, and you look at Huntsville in 1966. It's amazing. You look at the United States Air Force today and the United States Air Force in 1981 when I came in, it's more lethal, it's more powerful, so is the United States Army, so is the United States Navy, but the amazing thing about our Air Force, half the size it was in 1981. But more lethal in so many ways, more dangerous in so many ways, but half the size because of stealth and space and comm and cyber. And then the next challenge, the next huge change that our nation's military has to embrace is cyber. Because the cyber threat is real, the cyber threat is now. And the amazing thing is I, we walked into San Antonio where the Air Force cyber capabilities are a couple weeks ago, and you see airmen that have embraced that missionary and they get it 100%, but they're frustrated because the rest of the world doesn't understand. Because they're still of a culture of the cyber world as a benign environment. Does that sound familiar to you? Nobody understands the threats that are really there right now. And everybody says it's just fine. Everything's going to be OK. And they see the threats every day, and it's not. And so having space and cyber in the same command is a huge benefit, because really, it's all about information, getting information from one place to the other, denying an adversary that information when you need to, having the pathways for information available to the American warfighter wherever they need to go. That's space, and that's cyber. And we have them together in a single command. So change is not bad. Change is a great 
thing if it's embraced and, and pursued smartly. If you don't pursue it smartly, you can break things, and we have to make sure not to do that. But the last thing I want to talk about today is not space, it's not cyber. It's about uh, maybe the most important thing about this week. Because uh, this is Armed Forces Week in Huntsville. Uh, it's great that the rest of the country spends one day looking at Armed Forces Day and Huntsville spends a week. That tells you something about Huntsville right there, doesn't it? Uh, but, you know, we have soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, Coats Guardsmen, deployed around the world today. Uh, and as a, a four-star general, uh, you get to do some amazing things. And one of the things I get to do in Colorado is I get to stand up and represent the military uh, when the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame elects the United States military for induction into their Hall of Fame. And so you have to stand up and represent the entire force of the United States today, the entire force that has served throughout our history, and then try to say something intelligent uh, to make people understand how amazing such recognition was. And then I looked to my left, and to my left was Command Sergeant Major Clark, Command Sergeant Major of the 4th ID, because the Army was smart enough to send the Command Sergeant Major from the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson, and the Air Force sent a four-star general. And I looked at the Command Sergeant Major's uniform, and I saw six bronze stars with a combat V for valor. I don't know that I've ever seen six bronze stars on a uniform. No bronze stars. I've deployed once. Uh, Command Sergeant Major Clark has deployed eight times to Iraq and Afghanistan. He has done some amazing, heroic, nasty things. But he's done it for all the right reasons. And I've known people that have deployed over 10 times, 10 times into harm's way. And the other thing you have to remember is that those folks that deployed 10 times, they all volunteered. They were all volunteers to go do that business for their country. And they left behind folks that were not volunteers. They left behind family members. And in the, in the year I deployed, I always remember not really understanding the impact on your family until you actually come home. And you look at their faces and you understand what they've been through because they've been watching TV and reading the newspapers for the last year. And every bomb that goes off in Baghdad and every bomb that goes off in Kabul, they think it's got your name on it until they hear from you. And you don't communicate with them enough because you're working 20 hours a day and you're going like crazy every day that you're over there. But what we have to do, everybody in this room, and I know that you do it, but you can never do it enough, and that is we need to focus on taking care of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and their families, because the sacrifice they've given for the last, gosh, 14 years in combat has been exceptional. So I ask you to remember them in your prayers, in your thoughts, and in the work that you do. And I thank you for letting me come back to Huntsville. Thank you very much. <laughs>